Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by shamanspiritcenter.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. Today, I wanted to talk to you about your role in the narcissist's life. This is something that many people wonder about, so I thought we could talk about it on the show today. We have covered in previous shows how relationships with narcissistic people are transactional. So for a brief refresher here, that means that every relationship they have is one they get something out of. If they cannot get something from the person or the situation, they're generally not interested. You might say, but they're not getting anything out of their relationship with me or with this other person. No one buys them anything. No one gives them anything. But just because you don't see what they're getting doesn't mean they're not getting it. People in general, and narcissists in particular, don't engage in relationships that they get nothing out of at all. The difference is that most people understand they need to give in return, and narcissists do not believe that, nor do they do it. They may initially seem to give or give sporadically, but it's only to get something in return, and usually it doesn't last very long. They have very little to give, if anything at all, and they certainly can't waste it trying to finagle you into doing what they believe you should be doing anyway with no input or return from them whatsoever. We've also covered in previous shows how pathologically narcissistic people cannot take responsibility for anything. As a refresher on that, they essentially interpret responsibility as blame. Blame triggers shame in pathologically narcissistic people, and shame is tolerated extremely poorly by them, to put it gently. You have to be perfect. If you're not perfect, you're worthless. Period. They hold everybody to that standard, including themselves. That's why they blame and deflect and rationalize and justify and excuse and do absolutely everything they can to keep from admitting they did or said something that would be considered wrong, a failure, or even just a mistake. It isn't that they actually believe they're perfect. It's that facing that they're not is intolerable. Part of your job in a narcissistic person's life is to take the blame for everything. Whether they consciously realize they're recruiting people for that position or whether they're simply automatically doing what is required to survive doesn't matter because the end result is the same. In any relationship of any kind, there are times when the people involved teach each other. However, you can't teach a narcissist anything. They don't want to learn. Learning means changing or doing things differently. They don't want to do that. Many probably can't do that. This coupled with the things that we've discussed already here and a few others we've discussed in previous episodes of the show means you cannot correct or call them on their behavior ever, no matter what. They don't allow criticism, even if it's true, even if it's designed to help them, if it's designed to create positive change, it doesn't matter. They will reject, deflect, twist, or deny anything they do not want or cannot listen to in one way or another. This means that the only role you can ever have in a pathologically narcissistic person's life is as an enabler. It's all they will allow and it's all they will tolerate. Even so-called vulnerable narcissists who might accept the blame for everything are recruiting enablers because they don't use criticism as a catalyst for growth. They change nothing, and therefore they have accepted actually no true responsibility at all. They just want people to enable their pathological self-sabotage, helplessness, and masochistic grandiosity. Now, some people might say that they don't believe they are enablers because they don't condone or agree with a narcissistic person's behavior. The truth is, you don't have to do either one of these things to enable somebody. If you are in any kind of relationship with a narcissist, whether it's romantic or it's family or it's friendship, you're enabling them somehow even if you don't realize it because this is the only kind of connection they'll tolerate. For example, if Bobby's brother uses drugs in Bobby's house and Bobby does not approve, he might think that voicing his displeasure ensures that he's not an enabler. However, unless he puts an end to the situation, he's still enabling it. Yelling at the brother or having arguments over the drug use is simply what Bobby's brother has to put up with in order to do what he wants. It's not a consequence. It's just a necessary annoyance, like the fee you have to pay to drive on a toll road. There are usually other roads you could take. There are often other ways you could go, but driving on this road will get you where you want to go faster. So you pay. 
Now, drug use is a very obvious example used to illustrate a point, of course. Not all situations are that blatant. But even if there is no blatant abuse or misuse of other people or themselves at all, which is a rarity with narcissists, but it can happen sometimes, even if none of that is happening, anyone in a relationship with a narcissist is still enabling the narcissist's false image and their false reality. There's no way not to. Because no matter what you do or what you say, it will be twisted to fit the narrative of that false image and that false reality so that they can live with it. This is the toll that you must pay to drive on this road. For many people, it's too much. People often ask me, okay, so what can we do about this? What do we do to fix it? The answer is nothing. You cannot force someone to think, feel, believe, say, do, or perceive the way that you want them to. Many people cannot even do this for themselves, let alone for somebody else. The only thing you can do in any situation is understand the reality of the situation and decide how you're going to respond to that. This is where your power is, and it's huge. You have to make a decision. Is the toll too high? I hope that clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online, over the phone, via text, via messenger, via email, and through Skype. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit littleshaman.org and click the book and appointment tab to do that. I teach workshops a few times a month, so if you're interested in seeing what we're running right now or signing up for one of those, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by shamanspiritcenter.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, the little shaman. May the great spirit bless you and have a wonderful day.